Hey everybody, welcome to our first narrated PowerPoint. So while we're all quarantined and we have to move to distance learning, um, Mr. Teasler and I wanted to keep things as consistent as we could. So what that means is we're going to be videoing PowerPoints like this one, homework solutions, do right nows, and we're going to put all those up on this YouTube channel. So all the things we'd normally be going over and looking at in class, we're going to try to post videos of here for you guys now. Um, also, if you guys need to ask questions, um, you can always email Mr. Teasler or myself, but we're also going to be available through Google Hangout. We're going to have a schedule of the hours that we're going to be available um, online. Um, and as we move to online learning, a lot of things are changing. Um, I just want to make sure everybody knows if, if you have any feedback, any questions, any concerns, feel free to reach out. Um, this is, we're learning as much as you guys are right now how to handle this. So feedback is definitely welcome. And then we're just going to get started on this PowerPoint. So this is actually the PowerPoint we're working on before school closed. So this is electric current. Um, so about the first two thirds of this is going to be review. So stuff that we had already covered before. Um, so I'm just going to go over, cover that again because it's been a while since we've looked at it. So I'm not sure what everybody's going to remember, what you won't. Um, and then I'm just going to go right through to the end and cover the rest of electric current. So the first thing we had talked about was the electric battery. And what a battery does is it transforms chemical energy into electrical energy. Basically chemical reactions going on within the battery cause one terminal to be positively charged and the other to be negatively charged. Um, so this creates a potential difference between the two terminals. Um, and then this potential difference is maintained even if a current's flowing until one or the other terminal is completely dissolved. So basically as long as this chemical reaction is happening, um, this battery will create this same potential difference. So the potential difference or delta V is going to be constant. All right, and just so you guys know, um, a typical battery is going to be several cells connected together um, like this over here on the right hand side of the screen. Um, but you can also refer to a single cell as a battery, it's still going to do the same thing. And then while we have an actual visual of a battery up here on the uh, PowerPoint, I just want to point out that we have the positive terminal up here, so it's positively charged at this end. And then we have a negative terminal down here on the bottom that is negatively charged. And then this is what's creating the potential difference that's going to drive the current through our circuit. So whenever we have electric charges moving, we say that we have an electric current. And the current is just the rate at which the charge flows through the surface. Um, and mathematically, that means if we look at the charges flowing perpendicularly to a surface of area A, I is equal to delta Q over delta T. So in this formula here, I stands for current. I is going to be the letter that we use for current. Delta Q is the amount of charge flowing. And delta T is change in time. So it's the amount of charge that moves in a certain amount of time is our current I. And then just to remember, the SI unit for current is the ampere or amps. So one amp is equal to one coulomb divided by one second. So make sure that if you're using this formula, you have everything in base units. And so when we talk about current, we call the direction of current as the direction positive charge would flow. Um, this is what we call conventional current direction. So that would be from the positive terminal to the negative terminal, um, from positive to negative. But it's important to remember that in a common conductor such as copper, the current is actually due to the motion of electrons. So that means the flow of electrons is going to be in the opposite direction of the current in a circuit. Um, this can be a little tricky to remember, but when you're giving the direction of current, you have to remember these rules. Uh, conventional current is from positive to negative. The flow of electrons is going to be from negative to positive. And it's common to refer to a moving charge as a mobile charge carrier. So you guys should know all about charge carriers from our last unit. Um, so positive charge carriers would be protons. Negative charge carriers would be electrons. Um, and I think that's just review for you guys. But it's really important here to remember the two directions that current can be. Conventional current is from positive to negative, the flow of electrons is in the opposite direction. So on this slide here we can see what the actual motion of a charge carrier and a conductor would look like. So you can see the zigzagging black line which would show how an uh, electron carrying charge would move in a wire. 
Um, and these really sharp changes in direction, right, it looks like it's bouncing around all over the place, are because that electron is going to be colliding with all different things as it tries to move through this wire. Um, so the actual result of this is that the net drift speed, so sort of the net uh, velocity of these electrons as they move along a wire, uh, ends up being very slow. Um, right, so normally we think of electrons as something that moves very fast, but because they're bouncing around in all different directions, they're kind of just slowly drifting along through the wire. And then once again, it's just important to realize that the net motion of electrons is opposite the direction of the electric field. So the electric field and the current would be pointing one way, the actual velocity of the electrons is going to be in the opposite direction. So it's important to remember that even though the net drift speeds of electrons in a circuit is very slow, um, that when a circuit is completed, um, those electrons are all going to start moving nearly instantaneously. Um, so the electric field travels with a speed close to the speed of light. Basically what that means in realistic scenarios is that as soon as you close your circuit, you're going to have current flowing immediately. All right, and so when we talk about circuits, a complete circuit is gonna be any one where current can flow all the way around. So you need a connection from the positive terminal of the battery through a conducting material, through any uh, light bulbs like this picture here, and then all the way through to the negative terminal uninterrupted um, for current to flow and for the circuit to be considered complete. And also on this slide, you can see how um, the, the drawings that we use in physics to represent circuits don't necessarily look much like the actual physical circuits. So this circuit here on the left, where you can see the battery and the light bulb and the wires connecting them, is the same as this diagram on the right, where you can see sort of how we draw circuits in physics. Right, so like I just said, in order for current to flow, you need a path from one battery terminal through the entire circuit and back to the other battery terminal, um, uninterrupted if you want current to flow and you want a complete circuit. So out of these three here, only one of these circuits will actually work and will actually have current flowing. And I think we looked at this before we were uh, out of school, but in this case, it would be circuit C that has an uninterrupted path from positive through the circuit to negative. So circuit C here is the only one that would actually work. Um, circuit A is connected to the positive, but then the other end isn't connected anywhere, so there would be no current flow. And circuit B uh, has an uninterrupted path, but it goes from positive to positive. So once again, you wouldn't have any current flowing through that circuit. All right, so we already talked about this, but I think it's nice to see it with the visual of a circuit diagram alongside it. Um, so by convention, uh, current is defined as flowing from the positive to the negative um, terminals of the battery uh, through the circuit, but electrons actually flow in the opposite direction. So if you have a current that is due to the motion of electrons, the actual electron flow is gonna be in the opposite direction from the negative terminal to the positive terminal of the battery. All right, now we're going to start talking about George Simon Ohm. Um, so he is the guy who figured out that when you attach things to a circuit, they have a resistance. So he formulated that concept of resistance and found the proportionality to it. Um, so I'm not going to go a ton into his history, but just know he's going to have a bunch of things named after him because he's the one who discovered it. And so the most important thing we're going to be looking at from Ohm is Ohm's Law. Um, and he found that the ratio of voltage to current is called the resistance. So in mathematical terms, our resistance R is equal to our voltage V divided by our current represented by I. Um, and then if you just do a little bit of algebra, you multiply both sides by I, you can also find that the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. So both of these formulas are ones that will be useful to you depending on what numbers you know and what numbers you want to find out. These are both sort of valid ways of writing Ohm's Law. And so looking a little more at Ohm's Law, first off, in conductors, the resistance is independent of the voltage. Um, so what that means is if you're plugging a certain light bulb into your circuit, no matter what voltage you're running through it, so if you use a weaker or stronger power source, the resistance of that light bulb is going to be the same. Um, you also see on the right here sort of a graph of the relationship between voltage and current. Um, right, so math, this just comes right from the uh, equations we just looked at. So this is what it looks like graphically. Um, and then finally, the unit that we use for resistance is the ohm, which is this capital Greek letter omega. 
and one ohm is equal to one volt divided by one amp. So once again, what this tells us is that we have to have all our units in base units before we plug anything into an equation. And so a few clarifications before we keep moving on. Um, first, batteries maintain a nearly constant potential difference. Um, what that means is that a 9 volt battery is going to have a potential difference of 9 volts and that's not going to change, that will go up and down. Um, it's just the current that will vary. Um, second is that resistance is the property of a material or device. So like I said earlier, a certain light bulb is going to have the same resistance no matter what circuit you plug it into, no matter how much power you put through it. Um, third, a current is not a vector but it does have a direction. Right, because current can flow through a circuit in one direction or the other, but it's always going to be following the path of the wire or you know, whatever circuitry you put in there. And finally, current and charge do not get used up. Whatever charge goes in one end of a circuit comes out the other end. Right, so I think a lot of this is sort of repeating things we already talked about, but it's important things that you have it clarified before we keep going. Um, and you're going to need to understand this as we move forward. All right, and we looked at a graph like this earlier, but we're just going to look a little more in-depth at it now. Um, so a couple things to remember. First, the resistance is constant over a wide range of voltages. So what that means is our R value isn't going to be changing. Um, next is that the relationship between current and voltage is linear. So when we have a graph like this one here with the voltage on the x-axis and the current on the y-axis, uh, there's going to be a linear relationship between the two. And the slope of this graph is actually going to be equal to 1 over R. So the slope is related to the resistance of the circuit. All right, so now we can start talking about electric power. Um, so this is the same as when you learned about power during kinematics. Uh, electric power is going to be the energy transformed by a device per unit time. So we can see the equation here. Power is equal to energy transformed divided by time which for electricity is going to be equal to QV, that'll be the energy transformed, divided by your T. And if we remember that Q over T is equal to current, or I, you can also say that power is equal to current times voltage, or P equals IV. And then also if you take your first, uh, first equation here, P equals energy over time, uh, you multiply both sides by time, you can find that the total energy is going to equal the power times the time. So these are a few different equations that all could be useful at different times, so they're all good to know. And um, I think for the most part, power is going to be something, it's going to be the same as when you looked at it, you know, in the first half of the year. So just try to remember, think back to that, but just remembering is the energy transformed per unit time. All right, and when we look at this slide, um, the first thing I just want to point out is that these are two more formulas that we can use for power. Um, so this is using that power is equal to current times voltage formula that we just had on the last slide and combining it with Ohm's law to find that power is equal to I squared times R and that power is also equal to V squared divided by R. So these are two more equations that you could use if you need to find power depending on what variables you know originally and what you're trying to find out. So these are both also going to be useful equations. And then whenever we're talking about electrical power, the unit that we're going to be using is the watt, which is represented by a capital W. Um, and the watt is also going to be a derived unit, so you have to make sure everything you plug into these equations are in base units, or you're going to be off by a factor of 10 when you give your answers. So I know we've gotten a lot of formulas so far in this PowerPoint, but if you look at this slide, this wheel here can help you keep them all organized. So if you look in the center, we have our four main variables, power in watts, we have current in amps, resistance in ohms, and voltage in volts. And so if you have an unknown variable, any of these four that you want to solve for, you can pick any of these equations on the outside of the wheel to solve for it. So if I want to solve for current, I can use either voltage divided by resistance, I can use power divided by voltage, or I can use the square root of power divided by the resistance and all three of those equations would give me current. So depending on what my known variables are and what my unknown variables are, I can use this wheel to pick out the equation that I need to use. Alright, now we're starting to get into the things that we hadn't covered in the classroom before, so the review is over and we're getting into new stuff here. Uh, but this first slide shouldn't be anything too crazy to you because we already looked at some circuit diagrams. 
But as we go through current and then this unit on circuits, which is going to be next, we're going to be looking at a lot of circuit diagrams. So I just want to make sure you guys know all of the symbols we're going to use. Uh, so first we have a single cell, which is going to be one longer line and one shorter line, like interrupting your circuit here. Um, and that's just a single cell of a battery. And then a battery, which is the next one, is a series of those. And the longer lines indicate the positive terminal and the shorter lines indicate the negative terminal. So the positive side is always going to be the side with the longer lines on it. Uh, next we have a switch, which is just represented by um, just this, this piece of the, the circuit that sort of breaks off there, which indicates you can open or close it. So when it's up like that, that would be an open switch. And then if you close the switch, it would close the circuit and you get current flowing. Voltmeters and ammeters are pretty simple. They're just circles with their respective letters in it. So V for voltmeter, A for ammeter. And these are just things that we use to read. Um, a voltmeter reads our voltage and our ammeter reads our current or our amps. So pretty straightforward, pretty easy to remember. Um, next is a resistor, which is gonna be this sort of jagged line that we put in our, uh, in our circuit. And then a variable resistor just has this little arrow there, which just means a resistor that you can change the resistance of. And then finally at the bottom here, um, a lamp is a circle with sort of this curled up line in it. And then finally a motor is just a circle with an M in it. And sort of for miscellaneous things that you might plug into a circuit, a lot of the times you just make them a circle with some sort of labeling that indicates what it is. So like this circle with an M for motor, if you had something else that you were attaching to a circuit, you'd label it in probably a similar way. And so when you put a few of those together, you can get a circuit diagram like this one here. Uh, we have our battery up on this upper half of the circuit. You can see that the longer lines are to the left, so that's the positive terminal. So the positive terminal is to the left, the negative terminal is to the right. And then we can see a switch here on the bottom. So when the switch is open, the circuit is not complete and no current is going to flow. When you flip the switch and you close it, you're going to make that connection and current will start flowing through the circuit. And then finally, we just have this light here um, to the right of the switch. So when you have current flowing, that's going to light up. Okay, so the last circuit diagram we looked at was very simple. But to give you an idea of how complicated these can get, uh, right here we have a circuit diagram for a PC from fall of 1986. So this is a you know 30 year old piece of technology and you can see how complicated it is. Um, and then you could probably just imagine how complicated modern electronics are. So when we move forward and we start looking at more complicated circuits, just be happy we're not making you look at anything quite like this. All right, so we already talked about electric power and its relationship to energy. Um, so when you pay for your electric bill, you're not paying for the power you're getting. You're paying for the energy that you used and that's going to be the power consumption multiplied by the time so we're probably very used to measuring energy in units of joules for pretty much everything else we've looked at so far this year um, but when you pay your electric bill the electric company measures it in kilowatt hours so kilowatt is a thousand watts so that's a unit of power hours is a unit of time so power times time kilowatt hour is a unit of energy and to convert that to joules, which you're more familiar with, one kilowatt hour would be equal to 1,000 watts times 3,600 seconds, which would be 3.6 times 10 to the sixth joules. And so when we start looking at household circuits, um, we'll see that the wires used in homes to carry electricity have very low resistance. Um, but if the current is high enough, the power is still going to increase and the wires can become hot enough to start a fire. Um, so obviously we don't want fires starting in our homes, so what we do is we use two things, either fuses or circuit breakers, uh, which are designed to disconnect the circuit whenever the current goes above a predetermined value. So basically if our wires are getting too hot and we're getting towards the risk of a fire, um, the fuse or circuit breaker is going to go off, disconnect the circuit, stop the flow of current, and keep us safe. And so if we look at this slide here, we can see a couple examples of fuses and you see the common thing between these three styles of fuses are they, they all have a fuse ribbon in them and basically what a fuse ribbon is is uh, something that when the temperature begins to rise the fuse ribbon will break or the fuse will blow 
And once that happens, you're no longer going to have a complete circuit, so current will no longer flow through your circuit. Um, this will cause the temperature to stop rising and prevent you from reaching the point where fire is possible. Uh, this does make fuses one-use items, though. If your fuse blows, then the fuse is destroyed and you need to replace it. Um, so these are just one-use, one-time things, but they do keep you safe. And then we're also going to look at circuit breakers, which are now a lot more common than they used to be. Um, so these are switches that will open when the current and the temperature get to be too high. Uh, but then you're able to reset them. So unlike fuses, which are one use, a uh, circuit breaker can be reset. And if we look at both of these pictures, the circuit breaker in the closed and open positions, they have a bimetallic strip in them. And if you remember from thermodynamics, bimetallic strips function based on the linear expansion of these two metals. So because the, there's two different metals, they're going to expand at different rates as the temperature changes. So as the temperature gets higher, it's going to cause that bimetallic strip to bend, like you can see in the picture, which will allow the um, switch to open, disconnecting the circuit and stopping the flow of current. So if the temperature starts to get too high, the bimetallic strip will bend and open the circuit preventing the temperatures from continuing to rise. But then well, if you want to go back and reset it, you just have to recompress the string and push it back into its original position. And uh, then you're sort of back to the original position and the current can flow again. And then just to review electrical energy and power a little bit before we finish up, um, the SI unit of power is the watt. And whenever you're solving for power, you need your current I to be amperes. You need your resistance to be in ohms and your voltage to be in volts, right? Everything has to be in base units. Um, the unit of energy used by electric companies is the kilowatt hour, which is defined in terms of the unit of power, kilowatts, and the amount of time it is supplied, which is hours. And one kilowatt hour is equal to 3.6 times 10 to the sixth joules. And then this last page here is talking about the rates and costs of energy. So we can see this formula here, rate is equal to cost divided by energy. So your rate would be the dollars per kilowatt hour, so that's sort of what your electric company would be charging you for the electrical energy. Cost would be the total dollars that you're spending, and then E would be the energy you use in kilowatt hours. Um, and we looked at a couple of problems that sort of um, deal with this, so hopefully it's not too crazy, and uh, understanding this might help you guys out in the future when you have your own electric bills to pay, it's good stuff to understand.